Hi there, welcome back to the next series of movies in the iStill University Online Educational Program. Uh, some exciting news ahead. Uh, first we're going to talk about still design and then there's going to be a movie about how to set up, how to assemble and actually how you're going to get your iStill Mini, which is the still of choice that we sell basically together as a package with this course in order to not just tell you how the stilling works but to also teach you and train you on how to distill. You're going to make your own brandy, you're going to make your own whiskey soon on the iStill Mini. So the next movie, if you scroll down, is about getting that iStill Mini in. How does it look? How is it packaged? And then Willem, our laboratory manager, will explain how to set it up, how to assemble it, and after that how to run it. But before we dive into setting up your own iStill Mini, I want to take a bit of your time and talk about how distilleries and stills are designed. The reason I want to talk to you about still design is not because I want to make you a still designer. I don't want to take you all the way into how still design works. Because that's not your goal, you want to be a craft distiller, right? So you need a still and the reason I think we should address still design and some of the theories behind it is because the still is what helps concentrate your alcohol and accentuate the flavors you want to make in the spirits you're going to produce. Now if that still does it in a certain way, I want you to be able after this course to decide what kind of equipment would suit you and what kind of equipment is well less favorable for the spirits family that you're going to produce. A gin still may be optimal for gin. But if you understand why, you may also decide that maybe it's not the best still for your whiskey or your vodka. That's what I want to talk about today, about still design. And we're going to talk, if I go through the topics, about a few things. First we're going to look at the column or the riser. You know that part where the gases channel upwards. How does it look, how does it influence flavor creation, which is what you're doing as a craft distiller. Creating amazing flavors. Then we're going to look at how gases and liquids inside a column are managed. There are some three or four basic concepts to how to do that and very often different types of stills get categorized according to how liquids and vapors in the column are managed. And I'm going to explain to you in I think a pretty simple way how these technologies work and more importantly what are the drawbacks or the benefits of a certain column management system, given you want to make a certain drink. Third thing I want to look at today is basically what's inside the column, not the management system. But if we read this still, do we have a plated still, a packed still, a pot still, what are the differences? Again, translating it to benefits for that category for you as a distiller owning a craft distillery, making certain products. And then finally, I want to talk about the boiler. And the boiler is important because that's where you start your gas formation. That's where the stilling starts. And if we understand why boilers are designed a certain way, you can get a better comprehension of their functionality and the benefits that they offer or that some, some designs maybe do not offer. You can make a better informed decision on what equipment you need to buy. You can actually have a discussion with a, an equipment manufacturer instead of say, saying like, wow, I'm blown away by this beautiful piece of, of, of copper. You can actually have a talk, a discussion like, why is it designed the way it is and why should that benefit me instead of basically handing over your money and your ideas to a salesperson. You need to be educated. That's what we're going to do today. Do you remember, and if not, just watch the last video when we talked about the holy trinity of distillation. That is heads, hearts and tails and that depending on the product you want to make, you want to be able to smear more heads into your hearts for fruity flavors or smear more tails into your hearts for rooty, nutty and earthy flavors. Beginning of the run, end of the run. And in that video I explained that vapor speed is basically the energy that you use in order to get certain molecules over. Light molecules, low boiling point alcohols are light. They don't need a lot of energy to come over to make it through the riser 
over into the column the condenser into let's say your brandy. Let's say we're processing wine here. Not a lot of energy, light molecule, low boiling point translates into low vapor speeds. So the column needs to boil at low vapor speeds or the boiler needs to boil at low vapor speeds creating limited amount of gases and they still come over. The medium sized ethanol molecules or the heavy dudes like the high boiling points like furfural, propanol and butanol, high boiling point, heavy alcohol molecules with high boiling points, they need higher energy input, higher vapor speeds in the column in order to come over. Vapor speeds binds things together in the theoretical model that we explained in the last video, in the previous video. And if vapor speed is essential to flavor concentration and flavor selection, we better look at a still from that perspective. How does it influence flavor? Well, through the vapor speeds that it allows for through the controls that allows you to cut that. So you can make the same product over and over again or recreate the same vapor speeds for the same amount of heads, hearts and tail smearing. Quite easy, right? Let's look at the column. With this in mind, let's look at column design. Simply column design. And I'm just going to put four stripes on the board and we'll take it from there. This one doesn't really work. I'll take another one. Let's see if we can overlay that. Here we go. Let's say this is column number one. And there's a boiler underneath. For comparison reasons, we have another column that sits next to it on another boiler. And I hope the picture shows that the column to your right is of a more narrow design than the one close by to the left, which is of a wider design. Very simple, yet very important. Imagine what's happening in terms of vapor speeds. Let's say there's the same size of boiler underneath both columns. We boil the same kind of wine in there, the same kind of beer, the same kind of alcohol. We put in the same kind of power. Just to state a number, let's say we boil with an energy input of 10 kilowatt hours on this one and the same 10 kilowatt hours over here. So basically we're saying we are creating in column one and in column two exactly the same amount of vapors. 10 kilowatts. If this boiler is twice, or this column is twice as wide, what happens to the vapor speeds relative to the vapor speeds in column number two? Well, let's phrase it the other way around. If this column is only half the diameter from column number one, what happens to vapor speeds? We are creating the same amount of vapors. What happens to vapor speeds in number two comparative to number one? The answer is very easy. All those vapors have to go through the same column before they hit the bridge, before they hit the cooler, before they turn into a brandy, a whiskey or a rum or a gin. So basically, since this one is twice as wide, the vapor speeds in column number one are much lower relative to number two. Not to the factor two, right? Because we don't have two dimensional flat columns, columns are always round, so they're three-dimensional. So we have to look at the square root comparison and basically that means if column number one is twice as wide, as a rule of thumb, the overall internal diameter is four times bigger than column number two. And that basically translates into vapor speeds that are only one-fourth of the system over here. Or to put it the other way around, if the vapor speed is one in here, we will see that it's going to be four times that in the relatively small, more narrow column design. So now the next time you look at a column, 
I want you to see and establish if it's a wider design relative to another column or another still or another distillery that you visited or another offer that you got from a manufacturer. And tell yourself like, wow, I really like this wide design because, or I really enjoy this narrow design because. And the answer shouldn't be because I like the looks of it, but because it helps me create the spirit I actually want to make. Remember fruit brandy? <coughs> Focus on early flavors, early hat smearing, quite a lot of hat smearing actually. The hatsy components where the fruity flavors reside are very light. They're easily overrun by other flavors from the core ethanol or from the back end, which is why we want to make a fruit brandy a two-dimensional product, forward for the fruit and a center, but not a back end. In order not to pull tails through too quickly in the run and in order to separate out those fruity flavors nicely, we need low vapor speeds because low vapor speeds are enough to get those very fragile low boiling point alcohols and their associated taste molecules over. Where if we go for a same setup, same boiler, same power input, but with a narrow column design, four times the vapor speeds, instead of just pulling over that hats faction that is so important for our definition of a fruit brandy, we tend to overrun it with het ethanol from the hearts and early tails from the back end flavors. So in general, if you have a product that is like a fruit brandy or a brandy, or maybe even a gin that is fruit forward or front of mouth forward, two dimensional only, you might want to go for a slightly wider design in your column to lower vapor speeds so that you create more control over especially the hats faction with those very low energy low boiling point alcohols and flavors. Okay, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Let's, let's make a Jamaican rum. Let's make a Scottish single malt whiskey. Three dimensional product, right? You remember what it is a three dimensional product? Hats, hearts and tails. And where the fruit brandy tends to focus on the first two dimensions, a whiskey adds that third dimension, a lot of tail smearing, earthy, rooty flavors that stay in your mouth at the back end of your palate for up to 25, maybe 30 seconds. These are the heavy dudes. They need high vapor speeds in order to come over. It also means that you need a column that is relatively more narrow in design to create those high vapor speeds that actually translate into enough Tail smearing. If we would try to make a whiskey in a fruit brandy style column, it probably lacks in character at the back end. If we have a more narrow column design with higher vapor speeds, we create more of that third dimension, that tail smearing that is essential to making a great rum or a great whiskey. So column design and your selection of the right type of column for your still is very important. Essential, because it directly influences flavor profiles. And now if you look, and, and you probably went online, you probably visited quite a few distilleries, maybe you have stills yourself already. You remember a few of those classic stills, right? How do they look? Holstein, Mueller, Cote. Where do they come from? Southern Germany. What is Southern Germany famous for? Fruit brandy. Edelbrand. Fruit brandy still. So if you look at those stills, you can see that. They've got wide columns. They don't have narrow columns. They've got wide columns. And that's because they are originally designed for fruit brandy manufacture. Wider columns means better separation of the heads, hearts and tails factions due to less smearing, due to lower vapor speeds, so easier to make brandy. If you, if you imagine one of those, I always mix it up, swan necks or goose neck stills that they use in Scotland to make Scottish single malt whiskey. You see the design in front of you? It's a more narrow design. Not that big and plump design from southern Germany, narrow. And that makes perfect sense because if you want to harvest that third dimension, 
you want to focus here, and you do want to focus there if you create a product like single malt whiskey that may need to barrel age for 12, 15, or even 20 years, you need a narrow column because the narrow column creates the vapor speeds right for your product. Now before we go to the second topic, which is like how do we manage these columns, one more thing that is of importance. If you look at what I call the traditional fruit brandy still, very often a plated still will get to that. They are wide. If you go to a traditional pot still for whiskey and rum making, they are more narrow. You now understand why. But there is something else going on if you look at those stills, those gooseneck stills from Scotland. What do they do? As they go higher up in the air, they taper off. So they get less white as you go higher up in the column, higher up in the, in the riser. Why is that? <clears throat> is it to create faster vapor speeds? No, not really, because if it's smaller here than it is over here, well, we're still drawing from here and feeding that part, so we cannot really overall create higher vapor speeds once the gases are in the column. But see those stills in front of you, or look them up online, or, or look in your binder, and there's a few pictures there as well, if you have the course that we, that we give on paper. Um, Basically what you see is that these stills are made out of copper. Copper is not very good at insulating. That means that the higher the vapors travel, the more of the energy they lose. By basically touching the walls that are cooler, because these walls of the column are cooled from the outside air in the distillery, which is lower in temperature by definition than the inside of the column. And part of the gases lose their energy, shift back to liquid phase and start to drip down the sides of this column. In doing so, they lose energy. So the vapor speed as a result, the higher up you travel in the column, the higher up you travel in the riser, the vapor speed in an uninsulated system is going to drop. And since you want high vapor speeds in whiskey and three-dimensional rum, what is a normal tendency is to taper off the column to compensate for inefficiencies of working with a non-insulated column. Now, that's an interesting one, right? Because if you look at our column, it is relatively more narrow than it is wide. And it's insulated, so we don't need to taper off. So with our design, if you look at this side, I point at it, you look, see at the column, it's a relatively narrow column. But if we put insulation on the column, and because there is insulation, we don't get an inefficiency. We go, don't get an unwanted passive reflux. And as a result, we don't need to make a system that chokes, that tapers off towards the end. We can maintain vapor speeds simply by adding, really simply by adding insulation. And that's the way I like to think and look at distilling. Take away those inefficiencies and help you create and harvest more flavors more efficiently. Wider design, more narrow design, more narrow design for three-dimensional, third-dimension uh, highlighting products, and often that type of still with a more narrow column tapers off, is uninsulated, and it tapers off to compensate for energy losses as gases rise. That's the first part, guys.